to Allah Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. And yesterday's khutbah, we mentioned the hadith that's been collected by men Muslim, reported by Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam said, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ ثُمَّ أَتْبَعَهُ سِتًّا مِنْ شَوَالٍ كَانَ كَصِيَامِ الدَّهْرِ He or she, whoever, any Muslim that fasts the month of Ramadan successfully, completes the month, and then follows up that month with six additional days of fasting from the month of Shawal, shall receive the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like he fasted the entire year. Like he fasted the entire year. And we explained what that hadith meant in general. That the hasana, the good deed in al-Islam, is, is multiplied ten times or tenfold. As the Prophet والسلام, has said in the narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, collected by Imam Tirmidhi, and authenticated by Imam Tirmidhi as well, مَنْ قَرَأَ حَرْفًا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَلَهُ بِهِ حَسَنًا وَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا أو كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ والسلام. He says that whoever recites a letter from Allah's book, the Qur'an, will receive a hasana. And each and every hasana has ten of its likes. Ten of its likes. Let alone the text in the Kitab Al-Aziz, the Qur'an, that explains to us that the hasana, huh, that he who brings the hasana falahu khayrun minha, will have better than it, more than it. Naam? So therefore, the month of Ramadan, being 29 days or 30 days, is multiplied ten times which will equal or be equivalent to 10 months. And a person who fasts six days for the month of Shawwal, six times 10 equals 60, which is approximately two months, give or take a few days. And that equals a 12-month period. So that's the breakdown of that hadith. And that's what's meant by adah, time and not actual all of time, but actually one year. So we want to speak about tonight, Bidin Allah Ta'ala, are some of the things that pertain to the fasting to the month of Shawwal. Some of the masa'il, some of the issues that pertain to fasting this month, such as, what's the ruling on fasting this month? Is it obligatory? Is it recommended? Is it disliked? Is it haram? Is it an innovation? What do the people of knowledge say about fasting the six days of this month, let alone fasting the majority or the entire month of Shawwal? Secondly, if there is enough time, how to fast the six days. Those ulama, the people of knowledge, who hold the view that one should fast in the month of Shawwal, how? All together, split them up, the beginning of the month, the middle of the month, the end of the month, right after the Eid. Obviously, the Eid has passed already, but for future knowledge and benefit. And last but not least, B'dana Ta'ala, what are some of the fawaid, some of the benefits and the wisdoms behind these six days being fasted. Huh? Some of the wisdoms. Uh, and we previously laid down, like, or making a comparison between a game. A game, huh? We have the pre-game. We have the actual game. And we have the post-game. And within the game, there is the beginning of the game, the middle of the game, and the end of the game. So when you fast these six days in this month, the month of Shawwal, there are benefits and there are wisdoms that pertain to what has already passed, Ramadan. The six days of Shawwal are connected to something that's already done. It's finished. It's done. The game is over. And there are also fawad benefits of fasting the six days of Shawwal that have nothing to do with Ramadan for future benefit. Hmm? And then there are certain benefits that are in between huh? for the next year if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you life. So therefore, we'll make some commentary uh, on the kalam uh, Al-Hafidh bin Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala and his famous work Lata'if al-Ma'arif he says وَضَعِفُ شَهْرِ شَوَالِ وَفِيهِ مَجَالِسِ الْمَجْلِسُ الْأَوَّلِ فِي سِيَامِ شَوَالِ كُلِّهِ وَاتْبَعِي رَمَضَانِ بِسِيَامِ سِتَّةِ أَيَامِ مِنْ شَوَالِ he says and we previously explained what this book is about I believe we're in Baltimore, Maryland maybe about three or four years ago we did a summary of the entire book and we were explaining that the book is basically a calendar. It's a spiritual calendar. You know how like you have a calendar on your wall? And every month, and within each month, there are days, there are holidays, there are things to do. On this day, this person was born, this person died. Hmm? There are locations. So this book is basically a spiritual calendar, a calendar for the soul. And it is a book 
that is to show you and to prove to you that there's always something to do throughout the entire year. There's always something to do. And there's never a dry season. Everybody clear on this? If it's not Ramadan, it's Shawwal. If it's not Shawwal, it's Dhul Qadr. If it's not Dhul Qadr, it's Dhul Hijjah. If it's not Muharram, or Rajab, or Safar, there's always some type of virtuous ibadah to do throughout the entire 12 month year. It's a spiritual calendar. Everyone understand this? I don't think, and Allah knows best, that anyone's ever explained the book like this. Anyone's ever explained the concept of the book like this. Even though there are many brothers who read from this book. Many scholars, students, du'ats, imams who read from this book. Especially when they want to talk about Ramadan. It's a common staple book. You'll find Lataif al-Ma'arif is the book that he's using for his speech in Ramadan. But I don't think anyone's ever explained it like this. What the concept of the book is. So the book is basically made to show you month after month what to do. What's mentioned in the authentic sunnah pertaining to virtuous actions. Benefits, fawaid, and rulings. Everybody clear on this? We explained this on the channel a few years back. So, um, he has the next section after the month of Ramadan is the month of shawwal, wadha'if. Literally meaning jobs, duties, things to do. Okay? And the first thing that he wishes to speak on is fasting the entire month of shawwal. Fasting the entire month. Not six days, but the entire month. You ever heard of that before, Brother Khan? The entire month, he says. And if not, or and or, at least fasting six days of shawwal after Ramadan. Everybody clear on this? He says, خرج مسلم من حديث أبي أيوب الأنصاري رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال من صام رمضان ثم أتبعه ست من شوال كان كصيام الدهر وقد اخترف في هذا الحديث ثم في العمل به فمنه من صححه ومنه من قال هو منقوف قاله ابن عيينة وغيره وإليه يميل الإمام أحمد ومنه من تكلم في إسناده وأما العمل به فاستحب الصيام ستة أيام من شوال أكثر العلماء وروي ذلك عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما وطاووس والشعبي وميمون بن مهران وهو قول ابن المبارك والشافعي وأحمد وإسحاق وأنكر ذلك آخرون He says here that Imam Muslim has collected the narration that we previously mentioned to you reported by Abu Ayyub al-Ansari that the Prophet ﷺ is quoted to have said whoever fasts the month of Ramadan and follows it up with six additional days of shawal will receive the reward as if he fasted an entire year. He says that the scholars of Islam, they differ on this hadith. They have different views and different positions on this hadith. Okay, and what we're going to mention right now to avoid confusion is we're going to talk about the difference that they have on implementing this hadith. On implementing this hadith, all right? And all of our classes, Especially those on our Lulu Marjan, we constantly give focus on understanding the hadith properly from the Arabic language and from the principles of fiqh, usul al fiqh, even for the layman, let alone the student, let alone the advanced student, and also what the people of knowledge have to say about this narration. No, he says, Shafi, Ahmed, Abu Hanifa, Abu Thawr, Dawood ibn Ali, Al Zahiri, Fulan, etc. Huh? Very important to have the hadith and to understand it properly. He says, so there are many discrepancies about this hadith, many discrepancies. And from the discrepancies regarding this hadith is that which pertains to implementing it or not implementing it. Everybody clear on this? Scholars, they differ on how to understand and implement this hadith. He says, as far as acting upon this hadith, and as we just said, we've summarized Kalam, uh, the, the, what Ibn Rajab said, we're not going to get into authenticity and those issues. We're going to avoid that confusion right now in this majlis. He says here, uh, most of the ulama of Islam hold the view that it is recommended to fast the six days of Shawwal. Most of them, and not all of them, but most of them. From those who had this view was Abdullah ibn Abbas, uh, the great scholar of the companions. And also his disciples, from them is Tawus ibn Kaysan. Uh, also, from the Kibar Tabi'in, Sha'bi, rahimahullah ta'ala, from the great students of the Sahaba, Imam Sha'bi. Also, Maymun ibn Mihran, and it was also the view of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. Obviously, ibn al-Mubarak came later on. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak wasn't from the Tabi'in. He never met any of the Sahaba. And as a benefit for every single Muslim, let alone for an inspiring student of knowledge, or an advanced master of knowledge, you should always read the biography of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. He was one of the best of the best. 
And some of the scholars of hadith, they said about him, Jumi'at fihi khsarul khayr. They said he had everything. They say Abdullah ibn Mubarak had everything. He had knowledge. He was a warrior. He spent in Allah's cause. He was a zahid. He was a abid. Huh? They said that Allah gave him everything. Allah gave him all of the characteristics of good. He wasn't just a scholar, but he had a frail body or he, was a, he didn't fight on the battlefield. No, he was a warrior. He fought. He studied. He taught. He traveled. He avoided the dunya. He avoided, he avoided the rulers. He, he had all of the khisal al khayn. Huh? So read about Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, and you should also read about his father, and what his father used to be, and what his father came from, and the dua that his father made, and why he gave him the name that he gave him. Huh? Read about Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, very important story. Uh, as far as the uh, schools, the schools of thought, the well-known names, and then there's Shafi'i, rahimahullah, and then Shafi'i, he held the view that you should fast the six days of Shawwal. And also Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah ta'ala, also, the teacher of Imam al-Bukhari and the friend of Imam Ahmad is Haq. It's Haq ibn Rahawi, who was one of the most influential people on Imam al-Bukhari. It's Haq ibn Rahawi was one of the people who influenced Imam al-Bukhari to write his book. There were other reasons why Bukhari wrote his book. But Imam Ishaq was one of the people who gave him the, huh, the energy, the battery in the back, and pushed him to write his book, huh? and he wrote his book afterwards. Tayyip. So those are the ulama who hold the view that fasting the sixth day of the shawal are recommended. It's recommended. He then says, However, there are others who say no. You shouldn't fast the six days of Shawwal. There are others. he says, as far as uh, the scholars who held an, uh, an opposite view or a contrast view, then from them is Al Hassan Al Basri. And we all know what Hassan Al Basri is. Hassan Al Basri was from the Kibar Tabi'in as well. He was a major scholar, a major warrior, a major Zahid, a major Abid. He's someone that you should always read about. And Hassan Al Basri was known for his wisdom. So much so that there are people who compiled books on Mawa'id Al Hassan. They compile books on the admonishments that he gave to his students and his friends. He was, huh? He was always giving them a mo'ev. Hassan al-Basri was a great figure in Islamic history. Al-Hassan al-Basri, he said, or is narrated that he said, that Allah is pleased with the month of Ramadan. There's no need for any excess. There's no need for anything extra outside of the month of Ramadan. Now, uh, the author here, Ibn Rajab, he interprets his kalam. And he says, Hassan al-Basri didn't really mean that it's disliked to fast the month, the six days of Shawab. But Hassan al-Basri's speech means to reject those who say that you have to do it. That you have to do the six. And that's why he said that Ramadan, Allah is pleased with it. That's enough. Yani, for that which is mandatory. Now just stop here and look at this wisdom. Let's take an example of Salat al-Taraweeh. We know that Salat al-Taraweeh is not obligatory. It isn't obligatory. It's a recommended thing to do. Regardless whether you pray in congregation or whether you pray in your home in congregation or in your home by yourself. Al-Muhim. Those who do it have the option. The Prophet ﷺ, he prayed a few nights with the companions and then it was left off for a long time until the time of Umar anhu and Ubay ibn Kaab and they came together and they prayed all together in unison and Umar anhu said, what a great bid'ah this is. Meaning, what a good huh, revival of a previous sunnah this is. Tayyip. So people today, if you don't make taraweeh, or if you don't make taraweeh in a specific masjid, many people, they'll look down upon you, or they may say negative things about you, or think negatively. Everybody understand this? That's very similar to this issue. So if a brother says, I'm not fasting in six days of Shawab, automatically somebody would do what? <laughs> they'll think negative of him. And that's what Hassan al-Basri what? Awesome. Meant. Not meaning that you shouldn't do it and you can't do it. But what he meant was, is that there isn't anything extra after the month of Ramadan that's obligatory. 
in which a person is censured and looked down upon, therefore. Are you about to learn this? Having the narrations of the pious predecessors is only half of the battle. Understanding them and interpreting them properly in light of the text of Kitab and Sunnah is even more important. If there are hadiths that are interpreted a certain way and understood in a certain light, let alone the statement of Hassan al-Basri, let alone the statement of Imam Ahmed, and we always mention this, huh, Khalid? And the danger that this causes when you take someone's statement from the Tabi'in or even the Sahaba and you use that in front of the Kitab and the Sunnah. The Dalil is what Imam Ahmed said. The Dalil is what Sufyan al-Thawri said. The proof is what Hassan, no, 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 we don't say that. And that's no disrespect to none of those great Imams. But their speech is to be interpreted and understood in the light. And if there's no interpretation and no light, then we say that's the, that's the statement of that companion or that tabi. And the hadith is clear and sound from the kitab and from the sunnah. So therefore he says the Hasan al-Basri, that's what seems like he meant. He wasn't rejecting it, but saying that there isn't anything which is obligatory. Tayyip. As far as those who actually did hold the view that it was disliked, then from them is Sufyan al thawri and also Imam Abu Hanifa and his disciple Abu Yusuf and there are others. They held the view that you should not fast the six days of Shawwal. Why did they hold this view even though the hadith says that you should and most of the other ulama say that you should? He says uh, they held the view that it was a means of imitating the people of the scripture. The people of the scripture. The people of the, of the scripture, the Jews and the Christians, the Zoroastrians, the people that had something obligatory upon them, and they wanted to do more and extra. They wanted to make bid'ah. They wanted to get closer to Allah faster and quicker, so they did extra acts of ibadah. Everybody understand this? So they held the view that if you fast six days of shawal, it is a means of imitating who? The Jews and the Christians by not sufficing themselves with Ramadan. Then obviously... Uh, from one aspect, one says this makes sense. It sounds good. However, this is a view and an opinion fi maqabil al nas in front of what? Text. In front of text. Now, if Imam Abu Hanifa or Sufyan al Thawri or uh, these other people, if they said the hadith isn't authentic, then that's a different story. But if the hadith is authentic, it's there, there is no what? There's no view in front of clear text. There's no view in front of what? Clear text. Everybody clear in this? A text that is uh, uh, ambiguous is one thing. It can go more than one way. That's one thing. But the text says, Men sama Ramadana, thumma atba'ahu sitta min shu'a. The text is crystal clear. So there is no opinion or view. And this is something which can be found in many madhabs, not just in the Hanafi madhab, but in many, many madhabs, you'll find this. A view, a ra'i, an opinion, comes in front of the actual dalil. Now one may say, well maybe they didn't hear about the hadith. Maybe they didn't know about the hadith. Which is possible. And it's very plausible. However, when you study comparative fiqh, you'll, especially in the Hanafi madhab, you'll find them mentioning all types of hadiths that are totally weak and bogus and false. So one asks himself the serious question, what is the possibility that Abu Hanifa had this hadith with this kebab and this mutruk and this munkar and this mursal and he didn't hear about those other famous popular hadiths that his contemporaries had heard of it's very what? Ah, everybody clear this or not? so they held the view that it's a means of imitating the people of the scripture a means of imitating the what? the people of the scripture so therefore another problem that we have today the layman muslim who claims to follow a madhab or stick to a madhab how many people you know Uncle Faz? who say that they're Hanafi and they fast the six days of Shoah. Huh? Everybody clear this? So oftentimes, Taqlid, people don't know how to blindly follow properly. They don't even know what their madhab states. What? Properly, what the Imam actually said. As far as the Hanafis, later on, then some of them, they said that it's okay. That it's what? Okay. That it's okay. Tight. But Abu Hanifa said it's what? Makru. Tight. And that's why he said it. Moving forward, moving forward. He says here, وَكَرِهَا أَيْضًا مَالِكٌ وَذَكَرَ فِي الْمُوَطَّعِ أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَرَى أَحَدًا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْإِلْمِ وَالْفِقْهِ يَسُومُهَا قَالَ وَلَمْ يَبْلُغْنِ ذَلِكَ عَنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ السَّلَفِ وَأَنَّ أَهْلِ الْإِلْمِ يَكْرَهُونَ ذَلِكَ وَيَخَافُونَ بِدْعَتَهُ وَأَنْ يُلْحِقَ بِرَمَضَانَ مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ أَهْلُ الْجَهَالَةِ 
لو رأوا أحدا من أهل العلم يفعل ذلك. As far as Imam Malik رحمه الله, then he also held the view that these days should not be fasted. And he said the reason why he said that you shouldn't fast the six days of Shawwal, he says because I never saw anyone doing it. The people of Medina, Medina. and this is one of the usul of his madhab. The Quran and the Sunnah is the general constitution. But a heavy microscope and lens for the Kitab and the Sunnah is what? Medina. What the people of Medina did. It doesn't make sense for me to have an isolated hadith, a singular narration, and the people who learned from the Sahaba, who learned from the Messenger of Allah, aren't what? Doing aren't doing it. Let's make an example of this. Let's say I watch a movie, or listen to a song, or read a book about people in Queens, New York. This is a cultural norm of, them, of theirs. This is what they do. This, people in Queens, they say this. Or they dress like this. Or they eat this food, right? But then I come to Queens, and I, lived, I live in Queens for many, many, many years. And I, live, I go all over Queens, New York. Jamaica, Ozone Park, Richmond Hill, Corona, Sunnyside, Queensbridge, wherever I go in Queens. And I don't find anyone in Queens, what? Doing it or saying it or wearing it. Which one would you take? What you read out of a book or what you actually saw the people doing and implementing. So that, that is, that's his rationale. Is that right? Is that wrong? Is that absolute? al that's his what? His that's his rationale. So he said, I never saw anyone fasting the days of Shawal. The people of knowledge and fiqh. So therefore, I'm not going to what? Do it. I'm not going to do it. Everybody clear on this? And he then, it's also mentioned that he was afraid. He says that the people of knowledge, they dislike these days and they are afraid for an ignoramus to come along and to think that it's now a part of Ramadan. For an ignorant person to come along and say that it's what? A part of Ramadan. That was Imam Malik's rationale. Now, not to go too far off the topic, we know it's extremely dangerous when we have the Quran and Sunnah and we quote this person and that person. It's very dangerous. And oftentimes people who do this they don't realize what a responsibility it is. What a responsibility, what? It truly is now. Because the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, you consider it to be an authentic book. Most of the ulama hold the view that you should do it. Imam Muhammad held the view that what? You should fast those days. Imam Malik, he's basing his view off of the who? Who are also called the who? The Salaf. So a person says, I'm not, you can't take that hadith that's not the understanding of the Salaf. You can't take this because that's not the understanding of the, of the salaf. You can't go to this masjid, even though the Qur'an and Sunnah are full of the verses and hadiths, teach, make da'wah, call people, invite people, help out the ignorant people to say that's not the understanding of the salaf. The salaf, they never went to those innovative, those masjids of innovation. Now you're forced to take this view on what? Everything else. And from that, fasting these six days. And there are hundreds of other hadiths in Sahih Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, that you are not to implement because Imam Malik did not what? Implement them, and if not, waqat fit You're going to fall into clear contradiction. Everybody, clear this or not? You're going to fall into what? Clear, clear contradiction. So we live in the Dawah scene today, a messy collage. Okay, this companion, this scholar, this madhab, this modern day sheikh, and for you to think that you're actually following the organic way of the pious predecessors, you're living in a dream world. Rather, what you're following and what you're listening to is a, a, a pot of stew full of all different elements that are not from the pure organic way of the salah of salih. And if there was a madhab that was the closest to the actual, what you call the way of the salaf, it would be the madhab of who? Malik and not Ahmed. It would be the madhab of who? Malik. Imam Malik. Everybody understand this? Very interesting things. Shaykh al Ta'ala, one day, in the Sir Sir Huda Nur, he was talking about Ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, Imam Ibn Abdul Wahab, and Imam Malik. And he made a statement. He said that his aqidah was Salafi, but his fiqh wasn't. He wasn't Salafi al fiqh. And he said, if anyone who had a Salafi fiqh, then it would be who? Imam. Imam Malik. So let's, talk, let's stop and implement that now. The aqidah that the people learn today and implement today comes from, in most cases, the books of who? Imam no, not Imam Ahmed. Imam Ibn Abdul Wahab. Kitab al-Tawheed, al-Usul al-Thalatha, Kashf al-Shubahad, al-Qawaid al-Arba, Masail al-Jahiliya, Fadl al-Islam, right or wrong? So therefore, look how dangerous this is now. So is it being Salafi just an Aqidah or in all aspects of the religion? Everybody clear on this? To have a hadith that's clear to the point 
and to say, no, this person didn't understand it like that. And this one companion didn't say it like that. That's very dangerous. And not only is it dangerous, but it's a huge responsibility for you to follow that in what? All other aspects of the deen. Everybody clear on this or not? All other aspects of the what? Of the religion. So Imam Malik, he's saying, I'm not doing it. Nor should you do it. Because I didn't see anyone doing it. Now how is that even possible? How could the hadith be so famous, so popular, and no one in Medina did it, according to what he said? So these are issues of fiqh and hadith and this view and it's not that simple. Everything is not black and white. How people try to make it and throw it down your throat. Either you're following the way of the ulama or you're following bid'ah misguidance. You're following the understanding of the salaf or you're upon bid'ah misguidance. It's not that what? It's not that simple and easy. It's not that simple and it's not that what? It's not that you be careful. And the only thing that we want from mentioning these things it's not to cause confusion, but for, to, to spread the message of pump the brakes, Yaqi. We're not saying that you have to slow down 100%, but at least do what? Slow down a little bit. Take your time. Be easy. Especially if you haven't studied properly. You haven't studied formally. You barely can speak Arabic. You can't say a basic sentence without making three or four grammatical mistakes. You haven't studied and you haven't been evaluated properly. Slow down. Because you don't know what you're talking about. And if you're actually digging into these books, digging in the middle of them and reading and studying what the ulama of the past said and did, you will find it like night and day of your fiqh, even much of your aqidah. Night and day. When you read the athar of the salaf al and the sahaba, and what they said about this issue and about this view and about this tafsir. So just relax, ya khi. Take it easy on yourself first and foremost, and take it easy on the people. Everybody right, understand this? And if you have a view and or opinion, that's fine. But don't force it upon the rest of the people. Don't force it upon the people. Don't be aggressive and extreme. Don't be a zealot on a view in which you could be mistaken. And in most cases, well, you are mistaken. And the proof is what we read from these simple books, let alone if we actually went into what? The dungeon and went and dig through the books and, and, and brought out the statements of the people of knowledge of the past. So Imam Malik, he says... No one in Medina did it. And I'm afraid that people would think that it's obligatory, etc. So therefore, in brief, we have two views on the ulama. The view that seems to be most correct is that these days should be fasted. fasted. That's the view of most of the ulama. Most of the ulama, I say that you should what? Fast. Khayr, Fast. inshallah. The question is, this is a brief question. Did all of the companions remain in Medina, Abdul Qabi? They did what after the Prophet's death? <clears throat> They went to other places, whether it was Egypt, whether it was Iran, Iraq, North Africa, whatever the case, Egypt is a part of Africa, but I'm talking about like, you know, Andalus, Spain, etc. Are you about to or not? So is it possible for a companion to have heard something from the Prophet and saw something from the Prophet and didn't leave in Medina? Yeah, sure. It's very possible. So therefore, that rationale cannot be what? Absolute. Because all of the Salaf of Salih did not stay in Medina. Right, we're not here to discuss the, the madhabs. We're just trying to shed light on that. He then says, Rahimahullah, As far as those who say that you should fast those days, then there are three main ways or three different ways of looking at how one should fast them. Ahduha. أنه يستحب صيامها من أول الشهر متتابعة وقول الشافعي وابن المبارك. The first is that the days should be fasted all together, right after the day of the Eid. Start working on the six days of Shawwal. So based off of that view, one could have done what by now? Fasted all of them. Fasted all of them. He then says وثاني أنه لا فرق بين أن يتابعها أو يفرقها من الشهر كله وهما سواء the second way is that is no difference. Whether you do a day here, two days there, three days there, it doesn't what? It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter whether you do it in the beginning of Shawwal, the middle of Shawwal, or whether you do them all together or you split them up. doesn't matter. What's وَلَكِنْ يُصَامُوا ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ قَبْلَ أَيَّامٍ بِيذِي أَوْ بَعْدَهَا وَهَذَا قَوْلُ مَعْمَلٍ وَعَبْدِ الرَّزَاقِ وَيُرْعَنْ أَطَاعٍ He then says here, in the third style, 
is that a person should avoid fasting the six days of Shawwal directly after the Eid. Avoid fasting them what? Not the second day. He says a.m. The days of the Eid. Even though the day of Eid al-Fitr is only what? One day. But he's talking about the general what? The general time. The festive time. You're still visiting your family. Everybody clear on this? As we say in America, in the English language, with nothing to do with Islam, the holiday season. The holiday what? Season. season. Thanksgiving was Thursday. It's Saturday, Sunday, Monday. It's still the what time? It's still the time. Everybody understand? Even though Thanksgiving had passed already. I don't have to go to work yet. I'm still visiting my family. We're still eating, so on and so forth. Everybody clear on this? Huh? <laughs> go back to work? We actually turkey or what? <laughs> turkey sandwich? Huh? Everybody understand the point I'm trying to get to? No. The day in which the, the, the Eid in which there is, is multiple days is Eid of what? Abha. Eid Abha. How many days Eid Abha? Three or four? What would you say? Three. Four. Four days. Al Muhammad, we can agree that it's what? More than? One, one day. Eid al Fitr is only? One day. So what he's saying is A.M. of the Eid is the what? The general festive time. Your brother comes from down south, from Canada, from across the water, overseas. They're still visiting you. Everclinus, and you are still celebrating the what? The Eid, the Eid spirit. So it says, do not start after the, uh, Yom al-Fitr, uh, after Eid al-Fitr. Everclinus or not? And they say that one should do uh, before the white days. The white days. What are the white days? Or the white nights. We explained this in our comprehensive workshop on fasting in Ramadan Khalid. Is it a day or a white? Is it a day or a night? What's my AM al Beeth or Layal al Beeth? Which one? White day or white night? Nights. Nights. No. So you fast at night time? No, but the the, 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 the day starts with the night, Shaykh. Right? Tahir. Al Muhim is that when it's a full moon at night, in the daytime you were? Fasting. So from one aspect, the actual, the, the thing is the white day. But from another aspect, it's the white night. night because there's no full moon in the daytime. In the daytime. Yeah. Clear on this? Barakallahu yeah. feekum. So there are three ways. Everybody clear on this or not? There are what? Three ways. Three ways. Right, moving forward. The next thing the author, he speaks on fasting the entire month of Shawwal, which we're going to skip right now. And perhaps we'll come back to that. He mentions here He says what are the benefits now of fasting after Ramadan Halas, we fasted an entire month I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I've lo I lost enough weight I miss my wife's cooking enough Right? He says there are many benefits in what? Fasting, fasting after Ramadan Many benefits Minha, the first benefit the first wisdom is what? What's the first wisdom? It's not first wisdom. Not the first wisdom. It's the first wisdom. Okay, now that's not the first wisdom. Uh, if you're playing baseball. The, star, the, the, the lead batter. What's his job, Abdul Qawi? To do what? Hit a home run? Okay. To get on base. What's the first base he needs to get on first? First, first base. Maybe he gets the second, but at least what? Yeah. First base. So when you're studying, you get on first base first. And first base is what? The first wisdom 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 is what? Okay. The first wisdom is the sunnah. Good, but more specifically, no question. Now it's getting on first base. It's the sunnah. That's just like that. If you obey him, then you will what? Be guided. And Muhammad's way is a good example for those who want Allah in the last day. Tight, clear. But specifically, the first, the first wisdom is what? Is that a person will get the reward of? A whole year. Fasting an entire year. That's the first fight. Taib, you think about double, triple, home run, grand slam. Get on first base first. Even if you get hit with a pitch, or you get walked, or you have to hit a butt, is your job is to do what? Then you worry about stealing and an RBI. Clear on this? Taib, moving forward. Number two, he says, Women have. 
فيكمل بذلك ما حصل في الفرد من خلل ونقص فإن الفرائض تكمل بالنوافل يوم القيامة كما إلى آخر كلامه He says the next fa'idah, the next wisdom is that when you make fast in Sha'ban before Ramadan and fast in Shawwal after Ramadan, it is just like the what? The nafil prayers, the sunnah prayers that you do before the prayer and, and the purpose of those prayers are to do what? Is to patch up, patchwork. That's right. You were thinking about something, you were scratching, you are fiddling, you prayed, you were rushing. Can you say that your five daily prayers are done perfectly? A person can say, inshallah, a Muslim who's learnt and who's striving, he can say, I believe, I believe that my, my five daily prayers are at least fundamentally solid. You can say that. That I believe that they're what? Fundamentally, fundamentally solid. I can say that, inshallah. Ta'ala. But are they perfect? It's hard to say. So therefore, what you do before and after is a means of what? Perfecting those defects and those blemishes that are found in your prayer. Huh? As it's mentioned in the hadith about the day of judgment, the first thing that will be looked towards from a slave's actions is his what? His prayer. And if there's a deficiency or something lacking in his prayer, what will be done? The nafila. Everybody understand this? It's very important, like extra credit. Like what? Extra credit. So let's say you took an exam. And you barely passed the exam. You got a 59. But you chose to do what? The teacher says, anyone who wishes to do what? Extra credit. And you got a, you, the extra credit question was easy. Or you knew it. Or you weren't nervous. You really studied and you got the extra credit question good. So therefore, the extra credit is worth 20 points. Everybody clear on this? Now you've passed the exam. But if you didn't do the extra credit, you would have got a 59. That would have been what? Class. Everybody clear on this? So this is the next wisdom of fasting in the month of Shawwal. Is to cover up the mistakes and the flaws, the false speech, just like Zakat al Fitr, like we explained. Number three, وَمِنْهَا <laughs> كان ذلك علامة على قبول الحسنة الأولى كما أن من عمل حسنة ثم أتبعها بسيئة كان ذلك علامة رد الحسنة وعدم قبولها والعياذ بالله The third fight of Khalid he says it's a sign that the month of Ramadan was accepted from you Fasting in Shawwal is a sign that Allah had accepted the month from you No question From the sign or the signs that Allah has accepted an act of worship is that he gives the slave the ability to do what? More. More worship afterwards. Let's make an example of this. A tangible, worldly example. You do business with me, right? The business is good. Everything's well. What's the sign that I enjoy doing business with you? Or I really profited and I did well? What's the sign of that? Good transaction. Something more specific. I call you again. And I want to do what? Business with you again. Everybody clear on this? I gave you a deal with an opportunity. And the proof that you did a good job is that I give you a what? Okay. Another opportunity. Like a, con uh, a contractor. This house that you did for me, you did a great job. You did a what? A great job. So the proof that I'm pleased with what you did for me is that I give you a what? Another house. And a third and a fourth and a fifth. Clear on this? And the proof that I didn't enjoy my business with you. Or it was okay, but it was mediocre. It was, you know, it was okay. Is that I don't do what? I don't call you back for another job. Everybody clear on this? Can we agree on this or not? Is that I don't what? I don't call you again. Either you did a bad job or it was what? Yani, nothing special. I'm not going to go out my way and bring you to do another of my houses. But he did a superb job from start to finish. There's no doubt. Expect another what? They say, what, we'll call you, what? You don't call us. That's not the same as I'm going to call you. You go in for the interview, he says, what? Expect my call on Monday morning. Everybody clear on this or not? So he says, from the signs that your Ramadan was accepted, is that you fast and show up. Now, how many Muslims say this? May Allah accept your Ramadan. May Allah accept your fast. That's what everybody wants. But how many of us fast in six days? Right, moving on, and that's a major fight. That fight right there is sufficient. 
We can close the book. That's, that's more than enough right there. He says, because when you do a good deed and it's accepted, the sign is that Allah allows you to? Second. Just like doing a bad deed after the good deed is a sign what? That the first one wasn't accepted. What do you Women have. He says the next benefit of the Qawi is that fasting the month of Ramadan is a means of forgiveness of your sins. Man Sama Ramadana Iman in Wahti Saban Gufira Lahu Matakadam in Dambihi. He who fasts Amatha Ramadan and he does it because he believes in it and he hopes for the reward from Allah Azza he will he will receive what? Forgiveness of his sins. And it also he says here, moving forward, and that those who fast will receive their rewards in full on the day of judgment. The day of uh, in this life and in thereafter, and he says, during the day of the Eid, Yom al Jawa'is, the day of prizes. So he says, when a person fasts, after he previously fasts, it is a thankfulness to Allah for that blessing. And there isn't a blessing that's greater than your sins being forgiven. That's the greatest blessing. So fasting days of Shawwal is like paying a what? A tip. Like paying a what? A tip. You pay for the food, but the service was really good, so you give a what? Gratuity. You thank I appreciate how you served us. Even though the waitress was doing nothing but her what? Job. The waiter was doing nothing but his what? Job. That's his job. His job is to take care of the customers who come into the restaurant. But they did a good job. They brought the food. They brought the soup first before the main course meal. They brought the drinks. It was good. They gave you extra. They took care of you. So you give them a, a tip to show them that you appreciate them. All right, clearness? Because there's nothing better than what in a restaurant? No. Good service. There's nothing better than what? Good service. How many restaurants you go in and the food is delicious, but the service what? Horrible. You're not going to go back to that what? No matter how good the food is. They make fun of you or they try to charge you a tip extra. <laughs> and pose their way on you. huh? We have stories like this. Nah? <laughs> What's important is, is that he says it's thanking Allah for the blessing of your sins. Inshallah being forgiven. So, giving extra service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there isn't a blessing which is bigger or greater than your sins being what? Forgiven. forgiven. Allah forgives you for your acts of disobedience. And Allah loves you when you repent for your disrespect to Him. Hmm. The bounty of Allah is just endless. Huh? Allah gives you a reward for you doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's tremendous. Tayyip. Um... Uh, those that are in, uh, uh, that, that's the end of the fuwat that he's mentioned. There's a, a longer discussion. He talks about many, many things. And the most important thing that he concludes the chapter with is toba And repenting from one's sins and cleaning one's slate. Huh? So that's the end of what I wanted to mention here tonight. We ask Allah Azza wa to allow us to implement this and to accept it from us all. And to bless uh, your mouth and to accept your mouth. And to bless and to accept the six days of fasting that you choose to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I believe it may be time for a few questions if there, if there is any time. And if not, jazakumullah khayran. I got a question. Fadal. Okay, yeah. This hadith, like, you know, there is nothing better than fasting every other day. Okay. Since you're saying, mashallah, six days, and if you're saying, shawwal, fast the whole month is better if somebody can do it. So is he, can I, the other Imam, I ask him, so he said, we should not overtake what about Prophet Muhammad so say fast every other day. Nobody should fast every day. Okay. It's going to be too much. Tayyip. So is it going to affect anything in between, like, if I fast the whole month of Shawwal? Crystal clear. Month? Crystal clear. The question is regarding fasting every day and regarding fasting every other day. Regarding going against or doing more than what the Prophet ﷺ legislated, etc. Is it okay to fast the whole month of Shawwal, the whole month of Shaban, etc.? To keep things simple, we have general rules and we have specific rules. The general rule is that you should never fast all of the time. Siyam al In which every single day you're fasting. Because there are many things that you're going to have to neglect and abandon. 
whether it is physical strength, whether it is the, the rights of your wife, whatever it is, whatever, whatever it may be. And when I say rights of the wife, it doesn't just mean intimate rights. It can mean your wife making you breakfast. Your wife cooking you a lunch. She wants you to eat from her food and you say, I'm fasting. I'm fasting, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. Every day, you can never ever enjoy my waffles that I make for you. It's going to offend your wife. Everybody clear on this? So that's the general rules that you're never ever to fast all of the time. But the specific rules clearly state you can fast the entire month of Ramadan. You can fast all of or a lot of Shaban. Or all of or parts of Shawwal. Or every other day. Or three days and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is to do it all of the time. So let's say for, 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 for argument's sake. I fasted the whole month of Shaban. I fasted the whole month of Ramadan. I fasted the whole month of Shawwal. That's only three months. And then the fourth month, the month after that, I go back to every other day. Clear? Alhamdulillah. And Allah is best. Any questions from online? Initials OS from CC Hills, Illinois, USA. If her sister is moving to a new state and she's driving a car, is it permissible for her mom to follow directly behind her in this car, in his car? Or do they have to be in the same car for it to be considered traveling with a mahram? The mahram is just dropping her off and he needs a way to get back home. Question says, coming from Illinois, is it permissible for a woman to travel with her mahram in another car behind her, regardless of the reason, etc.? We've explained some of the details of modern day traveling on Mufti Q&A. Traveling by train, by plane, etc. Some of the modern day issues that pertain to traveling with or without a mahram. As far as the simple summarized answer here, then what is the wisdom of the mahram? Oftentimes when we read the hadith of the Prophet we have to have a balance between what the Prophet outwardly said, literally said, and between the wisdom and the reasoning behind what he said. So from one aspect, the Prophet ﷺ forbade a woman to travel without a mahram. Airplane, train, cameras, safe, the woman can defend herself, don't travel without a mahram. However, we look at the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. Why does a woman have to travel without a mahram? From those reasons, from them, minha. Well, that needs them. From those wisdoms is to protect the honor of the woman, is to keep the woman safe. Everybody understand this? And to prevent fools and evil men from trying to take advantage of a woman. And obviously, I don't want to offend no one. We live in 2018, so one says, well, I, I can take care of myself. I'm not a fool. I can defend myself. I can fight better than my husband. I'm not just going to sleep with anybody on an airplane or if I'm driving, so on and so forth. We're not getting that right now. Feminism, chauvinism, we're not getting all that right now. That, the Islam, the Hadith of the Prophet were well, not made to be politically correct. All right? They were not made to please and to suit every single person. All right? The Prophet said, don't travel without a mahram. And from the wisdoms of not traveling without a mahram or traveling with a mahram is what? Is protection, safety, and honor. Protection, safety, and honor. Everybody clear this? So if a woman is driving in a car and a mahram is behind her, Who's attacking her? Who's bothering her? Who's trying to do some harm to her? He's right there. So from one aspect, then kefarli al yani, the mahram is right there behind her. Everybody clear this? Let alone how far is the travel from one state to another. It could be 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You may be on the border. If you live in Philadelphia, which is in Pennsylvania, you travel to Camden, New Jersey. You go across the Ben Franklin Bridge or the Walt Women Bridge. That's less than 10 minutes. You're in another state. Everybody understand this? So if the mahram is there and the purpose of the mahram is still fulfilled in another car, I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see what? Anything wrong with that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Afadl. Ibrahim Ali from Sheffield, UK. How do we reconcile between the hadith of the Prophet prohibiting drinking, standing up, and him doing it? Question says, coming from the UK, how do we reconcile between a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ prohibiting standing up and him himself doing it, alayhi salatu wasalam? There are many ways of harmonizing between these types of hadiths, many ways. From them is to say, 
that it's haram to drink standing up unless there is a need or a necessity. A need or a necessity. In which there's a crowd of people around, you don't have the ability to sit down, you need the water, la bas. Another way is to say that it's not haram, but it's just disliked. Khilaf al You shouldn't do it, but it's not haram. So the hadith that say don't drink standing up, if you drink standing up, then spit up. Would you like shaitan to drink with you? Would you like this person to drink with you standing up? Meaning, you shouldn't do it. And the hadith of the Prophet, he drank standing up, proving that you can do it. Okay? There are different ways of harmonizing between this. And the ulama of Islam, they differ on the actual ruling. Perhaps those who say that it is haram to drink standing up, but permissible to do it if there is a need or difficulty, perhaps that is a strong view. Perhaps that's a what? A strong view. As Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahim ta'ala has explained in detail. And Allah knows best. This is the last one, inshallah. Taib, Jazakallah khairan, may Allah bless you and all the brothers and sisters in the United Kingdom. Bidna ta'ala, let's try to make another video in which we can give a bit more detail uh, with regards to daily life schedule in the Prophet's city. Obviously, we can't mention that now. Uh, we can't give you no more details than what we previously gave in that video. So hopefully we can make another video and we, we can give you more bidna ta'ala. Inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Kalas. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد